Well, good morning. This morning we are going to be finishing up a series that Pastor Allen started two weeks ago called The 923 Call. And with this, we're, the big overarching question that we're asking is, will you take up your cross daily and follow after Jesus? We obviously take this from, from Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Let's, let's read that together. Just refresh our memories on what the Word of God tells us, where this whole sermon series is based off of. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26 says, And he said to all, this is Jesus speaking here, says that anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. When I was, had the privilege of working at a summer camp, summer Christian camp, during my time in seminary, I got to work there for three years. One of the years that we were there, we had the theme, the overall theme of follow me in which we study the passage of Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38, which is actually the parallel passage to the one we just read here in Luke chapter 9. Not only did we study it with our campers week after week through the entire summer, but every staff member was required to memorize that passage as well. And it's a pretty lengthy passage, and I want to go back to that. So we actually have that on the screen for you as well. This is what Mark says, basically the same passage, but a few slight differences. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples. Yes, we had, uh, we had motions to it as well. For your sake, I actually don't remember the motions, unfortunately. But um, uh, we had motions that went along with it that we kind of led the campers through each time. But And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And here... I wanted to highlight those words, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And I wanted to highlight that simply because we're, we're looking at following after Jesus, of asking each individual person, myself, you, every single person sitting here, are you willing to take up your cross daily and follow after Jesus? And one thing that Mark mentions here is that you cannot separate being a follower of Jesus from following the gospel, from following his words. The words of Jesus and Jesus himself are inseparable. We cannot be like, hey, I want to be a follower of Jesus, but I'm going to completely disregard everything that this says. No, these two things are inseparable. You either follow Jesus and what he said, or you're not following Jesus at all. And I think Mark makes that clear in his version of that. And that's part of why I wanted to highlight that and why this has become such a cherished passage to me. And here we see in the Luke passage and in the Mark passage, simply an invitation to lose your life. An invitation to lose your life. And that is exactly what we invited each of our staff and each of our campers as well every summer to do for that summer. And that is what I believe that Jesus is calling us to do every single follower of him to do in this passage. Not just inviting us to do that, commanding. Commanding every single person to do in order to follow after him. Lose your life. So the question is, are you willing to lose your life? We've looked at three different aspects of this. We're we're looking at three different aspects through this study. Let me get a little crowd participation. So two weeks ago, when Pastor Allen introduced this, uh, this to us, he walked through um, the first aspect we saw was a call to what? Selflessness. Yes, a call to selflessness. 
We saw that in, in the passage, very clear there. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Very clear call to selflessness there that Pastor Allen talked about two weeks ago as he introduced this series. Then last week, we were looking at Ephesians 4, and he said, we see that within this passage also a call to walk in holiness. Yes, so a call to walk in selflessness, a call to walk in holiness. And this morning, we're going to finish it up by looking at a call to walk in worship. A call to walk in, in worship. And so let's, let's look at the proper perspective, first of all. The proper perspective, in order to be a worshiper, is that I am called to be a worshiper first and a worker second. I will present every area of my life as a living worship to him. That second part there, I think, is key. I will present every area, every aspect of who I am as a living worship to him. But what is worship? What is worship? There's obviously the Bible talks a lot about worship. And we could spend all day kind of looking at the different passages that talk about worship because that is a very common topic in the Bible. Uh, We're not going to do that. I've I've pulled out a few key passages that I think inform our understanding of what worship truly is from a biblical sense. And the first one I want to point us to is John chapter 4. So if you've got a copy of God's Word, and I hope that you do, I want to encourage you, invite you to turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And we come across a conversation that Jesus has with a woman at the well. And I think this is probably going to be familiar to the majority of us in this room. Jesus is traveling with his disciples And they come to a well, and he sends his disciples on into the town nearby to get food. And he stays there, and along comes this lady in the middle of the day. And there's a whole lot we can unpack here. This is a fascinating story about why she's there in the middle of the day, and a lot that happens in the conversation. Fantastic passage. We're going to focus on a slightly different section, a section that has to do with worship. And the key part of this passage right here that has to do with worship, is is in Jesus' response to her. We pick that conversation up in verse 22. John chapter 4, verse 22. Jesus responds to her and says, You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. He's talking about himself there. He being from the Jews, from Jewish lineage, salvation comes through me, Jesus. I am the only one that can provide you salvation. That's what he's referring to there. Verse 23, but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So Jesus here is responding to a question that the lady has. And I think the key point that we see here is that worship is not about location. Worship is not about location. That's point number one for us this morning. Worship is not about location. And, and to better understand what uh, Jesus is saying here, we got to back up a little bit in this conversation and see that he's responding to a question that the lady asked him first. So they've had this conversation uh, for quite a while now, and she kind of And verse 20 starts to redirect the conversation in a different way and brings up the topic of worship. She wants to know about worship and what Jesus thinks about that. And so in verse 20, we're going to pick up the conversation here. This is when she kind of introduces this. Verse 20, she's talking to Jesus. She says, Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So she's bringing up this question of worship and specifically the question of location. Should we worship here? This is what our people say. Right here on this mountain is the, is the proper place for worship. But you Jews, you say, no, the proper place for worship happens in Jerusalem. Well, which is it? And Jesus responds to her. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Then he goes on with a passage that we just read. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And that concept of spirit and truth, 
might be a little confusing to us. We'll, we'll actually come back to that here in a little bit. But the main point that I want us to see here is simply that worship is not about location. If you weren't able to uh, be a part of our Ecuador debrief um, when we had that, uh, many of our team, uh, it was a fantastic time just kind of sharing about our time in Ecuador, the things that we learned, the, things, the ways that we saw God move during that time. And one of the biggest ways that I think all of our team really sensed the presence of God was on Sunday morning when we got to go to a worship service there in the Kofani trap. So we had traveled to the jungle. We had uh, just had an incredible time, had some uh, near-death experiences. Um, we had some uh, just awesome time of connecting with the kids and connecting with Ronnie and hearing about his story. Um, but man, Sunday morning, we got to go to the worship service uh, with the Kofans. And there in that place, in a building that is much different than this building. It uh, doesn't have enclosed walls, um, doesn't have air conditioning, doesn't have proper lighting, uh, doesn't have a, a beautiful stage with all these different kind of instruments. Although they did have a keyboard player, and he was jamming out on that keyboard. If you talk to any of our team, man, he was going to town on that keyboard. It was, it was fun to watch him. Um, but man, I think every single one of our team would say that they were able to engage in worship in a very special and unique way without the conveniences and luxuries that we have each and every Sunday, and even on top of that, without even being able to understand a single word. The majority of us didn't understand a single word because it was all in the Kofan language. I think uh, uh, Jose was able to pick up a little bit because there's some similarities between uh, the Hispanic language and uh, between Spanish and the Kofan language, and so he picked up a little bit more than the rest of us, but every single one of us was able to engage in worship. It didn't matter whether we were here in the United States or in Ecuador. It didn't matter that some of the conveniences had been removed from us. Location did not matter. We were able to encounter the same God that we encounter here week in and week out. And it was special and it was unique. It kind of reminds me of another story, a story that a guy named Walker Moore shares um, that has a slight difference. He, uh, he tells of his first time attending a Hispanic worship service. And he didn't know a single word of Spanish. Uh, the pastor stood and talked, and the people sang some songs, and the people stood up and, and cried and talked, and they all sang some more. And this went on for about two hours, kind of similar to our service. Our service in the, in the, Kofani, in the Kofan tribe uh, lasted for about two hours or so. This went on for about two hours, talking, singing, crying, talking, singing, crying, two hours of it. Man, more Walker Moore was, was caught up in the service. Although he didn't understand a single word, he was praising God. He was in the presence of God. He was focused on him. After the service, he, he found someone who could interpret for him. And he asked, would you go with me? I want to tell the pastor how much I thoroughly enjoyed this worship service. And even though I didn't understand anything that was said, I truly felt God's presence. Well, the young man kind of looked at him, asked, are you sure you want to do that? Why not? Moore responded. Well, we didn't have a service tonight. It was a business meeting, and everyone was arguing his or her point. <laughs> well, Moore stood there for a minute, stunned. He says, praise God. I was able to worship him even through a business meeting. Maybe our business meeting should be more like that. What do you think about having a two-hour-long business meeting where we can argue and fuss and pray and, and praise God? What do you, what do you think? Two-hour business meeting? Can I get a second on that? Anybody? No? Okay. All right. I, I agree. I think our business meetings are good the way they are. <laughs> but worship is an integral part of a believer's life. See, God is not only looking for workers. He is also looking first and foremost for worshipers. Before we can engage in the work that God has called for us, he calls us to worship. Why? Well, because mission is temporary. Worship is eternal. God involves himself in the eternal. See, there's going to come a day when our mission comes to an end. We don't have to go out and tell others about Christ, which highlights the urgency of the mission that we have been given here and now. There will come a day when it is too late for them. We are either going to be spending an eternity in the presence of God or an eternity separated from the presence of God. And so one day our mission is going to come to an end. But worship is a unique thing that we have the opportunity of engaging right here, right now, 
and for the rest of eternity. Worship is eternal. And those two really go hand in hand. When you think about it, man, in order for me to live missionally, I need to live worshipfully. When I am living a life of worship before God, man, that is sometimes the best mission, the best witness that I can show to those around me by living a life of worship. You will never learn to worship until the person of Jesus Christ becomes the most important part of your life. Not second, but above everything else. You know, when I was, uh, I was kind of born and raised in a, in a small, smaller, semi-country town, and I had a lot of godly men uh, pour into my life, and I remember one of them, this was deep old country voice saying, son, you need to keep your priorities straight. You need to keep God first, family second, work third, similar like, like this. But it was, it was phrased to me a little bit differently because I was a student at the time, so he said, God, family, and then studies, school, okay? So whatever you find yourself in, and I, I think this is helpful. I think this is helpful to uh, make sure that God is first and foremost in our life and keep things in proper order. But I found that, that I think it's more helpful for me to, to view it kind of almost as a, a circle diagram. Instead of a list, to view it as a circle, kind of similar to this, to where Jesus is the central part of my life and everything else revolves around him. Not that God is just first in my life and things fall in under that, but no, everything is involved, is encompassed, fully encompassed by my relationship with Jesus, my family life, my friends, my, my work, my emotional side, my stewardship, Every single thing is fully encompassed by my relationship with Jesus, fully affected by that. I think that is a, a better picture of what worship truly is and what God is calling us to here, that everything falls within our relationship with Jesus. Or maybe you're not a, a diagram guy for where a list isn't really helpful or a circle diagram doesn't help. I know we got a lot of engineers in here, a lot of mathematically minded people. Maybe an equation is kind of more helpful for you. So I got an equation here for you. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. I actually stole this from, from a pastor friend in Louisville. I actually wrote a book uh, kind of about this whole theme. But I think this really captures the idea of what worship truly is. Jesus plus nothing. If you strip everything else away in life, and all I have left is Jesus, that is more than enough. That is more than enough for an abundant life, for the life of abundance that God is calling us to and wants for us. That is the beauty of living a life of worship before God. So, at the end of the day, the key point is that Jesus must become the most important part of our lives. And that's exactly what worship is all about. Whether a list diagram is helpful for you or a circle diagram or an equation, the point is that Jesus must become the most important part of your life. Because at the end of the day, if your basis, if your, if your happiness or your joy is based in anything else, it can be taken away. Your family, your work, your finances, whatever you're basing your happiness and joy in, it can be taken away and one day will be taken away. The word of God says, he will never leave you and forsake you. See, that's not true about Jesus. We have Jesus for eternity. We have the opportunity to worship for eternity. So we see first and foremost that worship is not about location. There's a couple other passages I want us to look at. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. I think we'll see our second point. We're going to look at two passages here that I think kind of make the same point. But Acts chapter 17, we, we come across this conversation with Paul. Paul's on a missionary journey, and he finds himself in the city of Athens. And as he's kind of walking around Athens, he sees all these idols to all these different gods, hundreds of different gods. And he stumbles across one idol to the unknown god. And later on, he works his way up to what's known as the Areopagus. It's a place where a lot of the Greek philosophers meet and kind of discuss philosophy and whatnot up in this area. And he, he meets with them, 
And we pick up this conversation. He engages them in conversation. We, we pick up this conversation, verse 22. So Acts 17, verse 22, is where we pick up this conversation going on. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the object of your worship, there it is, worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. I want us to look at another conversation, another encounter back in the Gospel of Mark. We looked at Mark 8 earlier. I want us to back up one chapter to Mark chapter 7. We come across another conversation. So there we see Paul engaging in conversation with a group of people who are not followers of God, not followers of Yahweh, not followers of Jesus. Here is a little bit different. See, Matt, we see uh, um, Jesus himself engaging with the religious leaders. He is having this conversation with a group of religious leaders who are followers of Yahweh. Let's, let's pick up this, this conversation here. Mark chapter 7, verse 6. Jesus responds to them, and he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And I think both these passages, the, the conversation with Jesus and the religious leaders and the conversation with Paul and the, the Greek philosophers is, is generally making uh, the same overarching um, claim here, the same overarching argument, and that is this, that worship is not about just going through the motions. You see, Paul encountered a group of Greek philosophers who were trying to make sure all of their bases were covered. See, we're going to worship this God and this God and every God that we know of to make sure we have all our bases covered. And just in case we've forgotten one, we're going to make an altar to the unknown God and worship that one too to make sure that there's none left out. We're going to cover all our bases. We're going through the motions of making sure every God out there is, is being worshipped and that we're covered by whatever God that is. They're going through the motions from a, a non-follower perspective. And Jesus is calling out these religious leaders here in the same way, saying, man, you guys are worshiping me in vain because you're teaching the do as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. So my question is, is our worship made up only of rules taught by men? Or is our worship grounded in the word of God itself? You see, coming here every Sunday or every Wednesday and hearing what Pastor Allen has to say, hearing what I might have to say on Wednesday night if you're a student, is not what your worship should be based in. Because anybody can get up on this stage and lead you in whatever direction. And I hope that's never the case at this church. As far as I know, I don't believe it ever has been, at least while I've been here. And I pray that that's always true. I believe with my own heart that every single staff, from Luke to Jim to Pastor Allen, I, even Melody and Jerry, lead grounded in the word of truth, word of God. We base our decisions and everything we do off this. My question is, is that the same? Is that true for you? Are you following after traditions of men? maybe what the Southern Baptist Convention has put down or what this church bylaws go by? Or is your worship grounded in what God's word says? That's a question that we all need to answer. You see, false worship is saying that you love God, yet not allowing him to work in your heart. It is singing, I want to be more like you, but not being yielded to holiness. It is saying, you are my Lord, yet not being yielded to his lordship. It's going through the motions of coming in here, 
singing, praising God, and never allowing it to affect our hearts and change us from the inside out. I recently listened to a song yesterday. Our family was worshiping uh, through music yesterday and uh, stumbled across a song for the first time, uh, a song by a guy named Jimmy Needham, who kind of nails us on the head. The song is called Clear the Stage, where he kind of really just captures this concept of not going through the motions. It also makes me think of the Matthew West song with the same title, Going Through the Motions, um, where, man, it's so easy to get caught up in just going through the motions and not allowing our heart to truly be changed by who God is. It is knowing the words to say, the scriptures to quote, and the times to raise your hands, but not meaning any of those words, not meaning any of that scripture or actions. See, that is false worship. Jesus said that true worship happens in spirit and in truth. Thinking back to Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well, true worship happens in spirit and in truth. Let's, let's break that down a little bit. I know that that might be confusing for us. What does it mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? We could go really in depth with that. I just want to give a, a brief kind of snippet of, of what it means to worship in spirit and truth. First of all, in spirit. God is the spirit, and he's, he's not a statue before which we bow. He is not someone that we can see. We worship what we do not see and cannot touch because our worship is invisible and intangible, which makes it an act of faith. And faith pleases God. That is what it means to worship God in spirit. Ultimately, an act of faith. Worshiping something that we cannot see, cannot touch, and therefore living out an act of faith. We're worshiping in spirit. Our spirit connecting with the spirit of God. That is what it means to worship in spirit. What about in truth? What does it mean for us to worship in truth? Well, I want to direct us to another conversation. We've seen a um, conversation with Jesus and the woman at the well. We saw a conversation with Paul on the Areopagus with the Greek philosophers. Then we looked at another conversation of Jesus with the religious leaders. And I want to point us to a fourth conversation, a fourth conversation with Jesus himself later on in his life. John chapter 4. No, not John chapter 4. John chapter 18. Sorry. John chapter 18. John chapter 18, we come across this conversation between Jesus and Pilate. At this point, Jesus has been arrested and is standing trial before Pilate, and Pilate's asking him a bunch of different questions. And we pick up this conversation in verse 37. Verse 37, John chapter 18, verse 37 is where we pick up this conversation. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? That may be a question that some of us in this room are asking now. We live in a world that really pushes back on the concept of truth? Is there truly only one way to get to heaven, to have a right relationship with God? Or is it more so just do your best and God will sort it at the end since he's a good God? Are you truly male or female? Or is that a mistake that God made and you truly should be a different gender? Is there such a thing as right and wrong? Or is it kind of up for, for you to decide as an individual based on your life circumstances? You see, Jesus is saying here that everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Are we listening to his voice? A true worshiper listens to the voice of Jesus. When Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, nobody else comes to the Father except through me. Very clear statement that there is only one way to a right relationship with God, and that is through me, Jesus Christ. There's no other way to make it happen. 
when, when Jesus grounds it and, and the Word of God makes it very clear that, man, he made male and female after his image, and those are good things. Even though we may uh, fulfill the roles and purposes that God gave us in different ways, we are both fully made in his image and meant to display that image. God didn't make any mistakes in regards to that. God has defined what is right and what is wrong. That is not for us to determine. That goes back to the, the age-old question of, of Adam and Eve faced, of, man, are they going to cease from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and define right and wrong for themselves? Or are they going to trust in what God has defined as right and wrong? And that choice lies before each and every one of us. A humble worshiper recognizes that God is God and that he, the worshiper, is not. This person depends on God for the ability to live holy, to submit to authority, to deny self, and to be a missionary. The humble worshiper recognizes a need for God's help in true worship. That's what worship is about. Hebrews 12 tells us, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So we've looked at two things of what worship is not. Worship is not about location. Worship is not about just going through the motions. But we haven't really answered the question, what is worship? So what is true worship? This brings us to point number three. Worship is proclaiming his glory, the glory of God. We see this pictured in, in 1 Corinthians 10.31, which is one of my favorite verses. And we I have our students quote this every time before we have a meal together. And if you're part of the student ministry, whether you're a student or an adult working in our student ministry, I want to invite you to join with me in quoting this with our hand motions, whether you're uh, with us online or not. I want you to do this together, all right? Here we go. 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. I love that, boy, that verse because it, it paints a beautiful picture for us of a lifestyle of worship. It makes me think of the Casting Crown song, Life Song, where everything in my life should be singing forth the praises and glory of who God is. A lifestyle of worship. It's not just something that we do on Sunday mornings. It's not just something that we, we do through Bible study uh, or when we gather together with the, the, the body of Christ. No, worship is truly a lifestyle. See, all of us were made as worshipers. Whether you believe it or not, every single person in this room, every single human being on the face of the earth is a worshiper. And I think it falls under two basic categories of what we are worshiping. We either worship God or are worshiping self. And we, as we worship self, it can take forms in all kinds of different areas, whether it's uh, worshiping our children or worshiping money or worshiping sex or worshiping whatever else, worshiping our work. Um, it can take all these different forms, but I think at the end of the day, it's rooted in self. We either worship ourselves or we worship the God who created us, the God who gave us his word to follow after him. So as we are living a lifestyle of worship, is that worship directed towards our creator God or directed towards ourselves? It makes me think of, of what John the Baptist proclaimed in John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. Another beautiful picture of this lifestyle of worship that we see. Worship is proclaiming his glory with all of my life. By walking in worship, we yield all glory to God not keeping any for ourselves. See that Jesus did this too. And he asked his followers to forsake their own interest in receiving glory and to instead glorify God with their lives and work and everything they do. Isaiah 25 verse 1 tells us, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful ensure. See, throughout the Bible, 
we are instructed to magnify God. By yielding all glory to God, we obey the command to exalt and magnify and glorify his name. But what does it mean to magnify God? Does it mean to, to make God bigger? I think of a magnifying glass where I like, look at an ant that I'm trying to burn as a little kid, and it like, gets big all of a sudden. Is that, is that what it means to, to magnify God, uh, to make him bigger? I don't think so. That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. When it, I found a helpful illustration that I actually stole from Pastor Allen, so thank you, Pastor Allen, if you're watching this online. Um, but he uses the illustration of a goldfish. You ever seen how big a goldfish gets in a pond? See, I'm used to these little goldfish in, in little bowls or tanks at friends' houses that are little bitty guys. They're not very impressive. Um, but man, one, I remember the first day that I saw a goldfish in a pond, and that circle was big. That was a big old goldfish. I was like, there ain't no way that's going to fit in my buddy's bowl back home. How does it get that big? See, these are the same goldfish as the tiny ones that we keep in our bowls at home. The only difference between the two is the size of the tank. Goldfish grow as big as their tank. And this helps me to realize a, a better understanding of what it means to magnify the Lord. It is not that we are to make him any bigger. How do you make God bigger anyway? It doesn't make a lot of sense. What he wants us to do is to enlarge our heart so that he can be bigger inside of us. To give control and complete lordship to every aspect of my heart, every aspect of my being. All the, a lot of us have this kind of philosophy of, of this guest room approach to God where we allow him into our lives and say, all right, Lord, you can, you can be the Lord while you're in your guest room. But the rest of the house belongs to me. When you come in the kitchen, this is still my kitchen. When you come to my room, when you come to my, my den, uh, when you come to my garage, these things still belong to me. You, you can hang out there every once in a while, but the only thing you're truly Lord of is the guest room, and you, you need to stay in your place. That's not what it means to magnify the Lord. To magnify the Lord is to give him every single aspect of who we are as individuals, saying, no, Lord, you are our Lord of every bit of who I am. Not just the areas that I want you to be. Not just the areas that are convenient for me at times. Every single aspect of who I am as an individual, you are Lord over those things. So how big is your God? What size tank do you keep God in? And maybe you've given God a super luxurious guest room. Go and pat yourself on the back. You're doing better than a lot of Christians out there. Has he taken control of your home, your entire home, your entire life? Is everything in your life encompassed by your relationship with Jesus? What size tank do you keep God in? Last point I want us to, to see about worship is that worship is a sacrificial lifestyle. Pastor Allen mentioned this, this verse uh, last week. In Romans 12, 1, we kind of see a glimpse of this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, because this is your spiritual worship. Presenting your life as a living sacrifice to God is exactly what it means to take up your cross daily, to deny yourself daily, and to follow after Jesus each and every day. As we close here, I want to challenge us with a few questions. What words of worship can you say and mean? I want to actually invite everybody, get out, get out a pen, notebook, if you don't have a pen or notebook, maybe pull out your phone, jot this down real quick. Write out a prayer of worship to God. Write out prayer of worship to God. I think this is a, a fantastic first step for us in pursuing after a more intimate lifestyle of worship before God. Write out a prayer of worship before God. In a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation where you can respond to however God's leading you and that would be a great way to respond. And you, can, you don't have to just come down here 
to, to pray in a traditional sense, man, bring your notebook and pen down here and begin writing out a prayer of worship to God. One great way to start when you think through that is describe the example of Jesus as a worshiper. Man, the greatest worshiper who ever walked this earth is Jesus himself. Examine his life and think about, man, how did he worship and how can I model that in my life? That'd be a great place for us to start as we write out a, worship, a prayer of worship to God. How can you go further in your walk of worship? So as we end our time, as we end this study, the question remains, will you answer the 923 call? Will you commit to be a, being a missionary to your world, in your workplace, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your school, wherever God has placed you, will you commit to living a lifestyle of worship that is connected to your missional living there. A life of selflessness, a life of holiness, a life of worship. This call is universal to every single human being who walks the face of the earth. We all have responsibility, and no one can do it for you. But the beauty is that we can help one another. That is the beauty of the body of Christ, that as I'm worshiping, I can be encouraged and strengthened by my brother and sister worshiping along beside of me. As I'm living missionally and attempting to share who Jesus is to me with those around me, it is so encouraging to have another brother or sister who's doing the exact same thing, and I can uh, learn from them and, and be encouraged by them. If you will surrender, God will bless you and use you in ways that you could never imagine. If you refuse, you will never reach your full potential as a servant of Jesus Christ. So will you answer the call? Father, thank you for just the opportunity to worship you. Lord, I pray that this morning would not be the only time that we come to worship you. Lord, that would not just be an activity that we do. Lord, that it would be a lifestyle that we live. Lord, help us to take this 923 call seriously in our lives. To pursue a walk of selflessness. To pursue a walk of holiness. To pursue a walk of daily worship with you. As we daily take up our cross and follow after you. Pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.